Welcome everyone, we have an exciting panel and we will get started first with introductions. To my left, we have Alicia McCoy, who is um, CEO of Peak Mind. Alicia is a Ball State graduate and is here to tell us about her entrepreneurial experiences and the work that she does in empowering employees in the health and wellness space. Um, to her right, we have Wayne Patrick, Wayne is a mentor and investor in several startup and entrepreneurial companies. Wayne has 40 years of experience in information technology, including serving as IT director for a Fortune 500 financial and insurance company. Uh, Wayne received the Sagamore of the Wabash, congratulations, in 1992, and was a presidential delegate to the White House Conference on Small Business. In 2000, he was a finalist for the ENY Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Wayne is a graduate of Rose Holman and earned an MBA from Butler University and an executive MBA from Dartmouth. So welcome, Wayne. And last but not least, Jantina Anderson. Jantina is an urban education studies doctoral candidate at Indiana University, Indianapolis campus. She is an emerging educational leadership scholar with research interests around belonging and black girls and women's narratives and lived experiences in organizational and institutional spaces. Her research is used to further conversations around institutional and organizational leadership, administration, and policies while centering social justice issues to support the holistic success of black women and girls, very important topics. Uh, while pursuing her doctoral degree, Jantina has excelled in the human resources field for various Fortune 500 companies and is currently an HR director. She is a proud alumna of Clark Atlanta University, Michigan State University as well, and resides in Indy with her husband and two daughters. So thank you panelists for joining us. We do have a um, compelling topic today and we're really talking about shifts that you've seen professionally in the midst of what we are calling a racial reckoning, and that perhaps is up for debate as well. Um, but excited to hear your perspective and have you share about your experiences. And so I'll, um, I'll start with the, um, um, the gentleman on the panel. panel. <laughs> and um, Wayne, so for you, if you could please share with our audience um, the most compelling example from the last two years that you've experienced um, in terms of a shift in your um, business and businesses that you support um, that can tie directly to America's racial reckoning. Absolutely. And thanks so much, first of all, for allowing me to be here with this great panel of all these very strong women. I appreciate that a great deal. Um, over the past uh, several years since George Floyd, and that seemed to be kind of the tipping point, there have been many, many changes in what I would call the racial landscape in the business world. I'm currently consulting with an organization uh, that is a network and infrastructure telecommunicate or uh, IT technology company. Uh, what I have seen with that uh, organization, and then I'll take it to the corporate side, is that the biggest issue for the owner um, was to accept and believe that the racial reckoning and the pivot by corporations was real. Heard this story many, many times before, mm -hmm. should I believe it this time? Fortunately, he's had enough experience and we've had enough things go on that he's at a point of position now where he really does believe. One of the biggest and best examples of that, and I don't think anyone should be surprised, has been our experience with Eli Lilly. Eli Lilly developed a mentor-protege program. Uh, and it wasn't just the normal thing of, gee, we're going to have some protégés and we're going to invite them in and we're going to talk to them and say nice things. Wonderful. What they did was they got a group of protégés who they assigned internal mentors within the organization. And they did it right. These mentors were assigned to help these organizations understand how to do business with Eli Lilly. So they actually trained them on the most effective way to work with us and do business mm -hmm. with us. Mm -hmm. Once they had done that, then they also opened doors and gave them access to the people who could help them do business with Eli Lilly. So I think once again, Eli Lilly was a leader and did it right and showed the way for how 
if you really are serious about mentoring and moving black small businesses along the path, there is a right way to do it. That's a great example, it's really taking it to the next level Absolutely. in terms of collaboration. So Alicia, I'll ask you the same question, any example that you'd like to share? Well, as a African-American tech founder, you know, we've seen it that's raising institutional funding, right? Raising capital for our technology and innovation that we're building. We have seen a lot more people come online, a lot of financial institutions and organizations making pledges for financial, you know, in, investing in black and brown communities. We filled out hundreds of applications potentially over the last couple of years. And so, but the pool of people who are going after that same funding Right, the pool has been there, and now you have small opportunities. And so, there's a lot of we've seen just a lot of people going after those different funding opportunities. But it's it's great that the funding opportunities are there. Even AWS, you know, pledging Salesforce just pledged a hundred million dollars increase to, you know, or total dollars spent towards black and brown companies. Like he said, you know, not only mentoring but also on the procurement space. So we've seen those different opportunities open up for us, um, and just again trying to set yourself apart as a black and brown founder is is the challenge, the next level of challenge in that space. How would you say venture capital firms are faring vis-a-vis -vis corporations in this space? Mm. Are they behind? Mm. Are they pushing the envelope in terms of VC funding, angel investing? Well, I think they're all trying. They're all making commitments. Um, I don't know that I've seen a lot of numbers, number commitments. Corporations are all are good for setting, you know, a percent and a dollar amount that they're going to spend towards that VC. I don't believe most of them have made, you know, numbers so that they can be measured against. Mm -hmm. I think most of them are saying they want to increase numbers, and so I'd love to see more metrics, you know, being positioned and, and pledged in that space. If it's okay, I could give you a metric. Mm -hmm. Okay, please. Twenty twenty one, forty four billion dollars doled out by Z VC firms. Of that, 4% went to black and brown firms. Okay. Obviously, there's still a long way to go. Long now, way to go. that 4% was a dramatic increase from what it was the year before when it was less than 8%. Mm -hmm. Less so, than 1%. 1%, okay. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, we, we measure what we treasure, right? Absolutely. So finding yeah. those metrics. So, Jantina, I'll, I'll have you answer the same question. Sure. So, what I've seen, not only in, I'll say, the business world or corporate America, but also in society, uh, two things come to mind. So, one would be a growing discussion regarding race issues, regarding systematic oppression, discrimination, et cetera. I think in the past, many of those conversations have been held within the communities that have experienced the oppression and the discrimination. Um, but after 2020, and, and really I think the three pivotal killings or murders, so George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Aubrey, others began to join those conversations and really realize that this is not just something that is imagined or a one-off incident. This happens frequently, and here are multiple examples within a short period of time. Um, and I think those conversations are important, but however, we're waiting to see what the, the actions are behind those conversations. We've shared multiple ideas, we've given um, suggestions, we've, we've talked about initiatives that can be implemented, but we're waiting to see the organizations kind of put the investment behind those conversations. And I would say socially, um, we've seen similar conversations, but we've also seen I would say more effort to suppress the history and to suppress some of those truths that are coming forward. Mm -hmm. We see that in the, the form of critical race theory backlash. We see that in the form of, of government saying no to diversity and inclusion training, where those opportunities really create environments and spaces where people can have these conversations that will help us move forward. On the positive side, I will say that there are some organizations, and to what you all have mentioned um, just now, they're investing in the communities. However, I don't necessarily see the long-term investment. Mm. They're investing in the communities for, some will call it performative opportunities, where they may be providing a scholarship. They may sign up to um, meet a particular goal. But when we look at how those achievements benefit the black community, there's still a long ways to go. Well, I think you, that's a perfect segue because the question that I wanted to pose to each of you next is really around the role 
of corporate America? What do organizations, um, what purpose do they serve and what role do they play? So here we are at the Anopower Minority <coughs> Business Conference. And so one could argue that Congress and, and legislative processes are the way that systemic change happens. Others may argue that it's the judicial branch and that that is where we should be looking to our elected or nominated judges. So just for a little bit of background, we talked a little bit about some numbers. Um, so as of summer of 2021, America's 50 largest public companies and their foundations collectively committed at least $49.5 billion since George Floyd's death. And according to an investigation by the Washington Post, more than 90% of that amount, $45.2 billion, is allocated as loans or investments, which we all know have an obligation, right, to the borrower. Um, meanwhile, less than 1% of the net income of those companies, um, which is still a large number, $4 billion, came in the um, form of outright grants, right, which have no corresponding um, obligation. So what we're faced with now is whether companies who pledge dollar amounts are actually putting those dollars towards mm -hmm. issues and causes that really move the needle. And so my question for each of you is really, what role do you think the corporate enterprise, not any individual company, but just as a entity, should play when it comes to social justice and systemic change? So I will um, ask whoever would like to tackle that large question first. I'll actually um, share my thoughts around that. So as far as corporations and their role in social justice change and improvement, um, I really believe that they should be a part of the leadership in leading the way. When you think about the impact of corporations across the nation, whether it's providing income, providing resources, providing products and services to communities across the nation or to the population, they play a pivotal role. So why would we hold them any less accountable in making sure that the nation is equal, fair, and moral for all who reside within the nation? So I really believe that they should play a leadership role okay. in the social changes. Wayne or okay. Alicia? Uh, well, I believe from an education and um, information standpoint, corporations, like you said, take a leadership stance and educate their employees on their position, you know, and having conversations, I think, is what I like to say, you know, communicate um, publicly about their stance, communicate in the organization, set the metrics, you know, how many diverse employees do they currently hire, what do they spend, you know, and when do they want, like you said, the, the long-term spend each year on minority businesses, as well as internal growth opportunities for minorities to bring up in their organization educate the company on what diversity, equity, and inclusion mean to the company. Because as we know, definition, you know, defining those terms is different to everybody, and some people don't even have those definitions. I sit on a board of directors and on the DEI committee, and that's the first thing we're identifying is what does, what do those terms mean? Mm -hmm. What's our vision and mission for that as a committee, right, as we roll it out to the board, and as we roll it out to the, the members that work for the company. And so that's a critical conversation to have Hmm. Okay, I, I think I sit in the middle of the, the ladies here and probably support everything that they said. I'm a nuts and bolts kind of guy, mm -hmm. so I look mm -hmm. at it from boom, 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 right? So number one, organizations need to influence. We all understand that money is power in this company, country, and they should use their money and their power and their influence, back to what you said, to help to direct the actions and the things that the organizations who have systemic racism do, the judicial system, the legislative system, they should use that influence back to what she said around what they think, what they feel, what they believe to make sure those organizations understand them as people of power believe this way and if you are going to be okay with someone like me, this is what I expect and need you to do. Secondly, they need to employ, mm -hmm. okay? They've got to employ folks and bring them in because if they're not there, they can't benefit. Once you get them in, not only do you have to employ them, but you gotta train them and you have to promote them. And so I believe those two roles are one of the most important things that they can do internally is still to employ people, hire folks, and once they have them in, 
train them and guide them and give them opportunity to be promoted and grow up the corporate chain. If they do those things, a lot of those other things will take care of themselves. I'm a strong believer that wealth and independence, financial independence, is really one of the biggest and strongest keys to solving those issues and problems because once you have those, then you don't have to ask someone else to do it for you. Okay, so you're saying the social change, social justice endeavors come secondary if businesses can handle hiring, training, and promotion. I'm saying that those things will happen naturally as a result of those things because their influence will impact those social changes and if we are employed and earn and have w financial wealth and independence, we then have the power and the ability to navigate and work within the system sure. to influence those social okay. changes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I really appreciate that. I think as corporations are starting to step into the fray, right, you see a lot of CEOs making public statements, um, statements of solidarity, we'll call them, using social media you really sometimes have to come back to the basics. Absolutely. And say, how are you treating your employees, right? Before you can weigh in on this piece of legislation, legislation perhaps it's a little bit more of an um, inward looking process that they can do. So, okay, I appreciate the perspective each of you shared. Um, so, Alicia, this question's for you, but others feel free to weigh in. Um, when you think about um, your space as a business owner, and all of the things that come along with starting a business, right? You are um, fundraising, you are um, actively out there trying to identify your, your market, um, assessing competition, et cetera. But then you're also a black woman, right? And so you are living and working within a world where currently there are so many things happening that tend to impact people of color. And so if you could just share with the audience a little bit about how um, serving as a, um, a leader during this racial reckoning period has directly impacted operations or um, strategic planning at the company? Sure, I think, yeah. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> Not much. Um, you know, I think the first thing that friends and family looked to me to when everything was happening, they looked to me to say, how do you use your own influence to speak out? You know, and so I really had to take a pause and say, when I speak, I speak on behalf of my company, I speak on behalf of my shareholders, the boards I sit on. So I had to calculate and decide what am, what are my public statements? And so I took time to really reflect and I, I put out a post on our company's website, on our social media, about where I stand and the company stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion, how we're going to hire. And I think we put that out pretty early on during the pandemic because I knew that as a leader, people look to you to make those statements. And so, but also backing it, right? So we just staying continual, continuously, you know, reinforcing that and so even last week when we did our company um, quarterly event we talked about diversity equity and inclusion right it was two slides on our PowerPoint for all of our staff to say remember that this is a stance this is what we you know LGBTQ here's what we you know are we even have at the bottom of our emails educating our employees on why that's important so yes we wrote that two years ago and made that stance but continuing to put it out there even on LinkedIn you know I put we're um, trans friendly we're LGBTQ friendly as hiring and so I have she hers on my LinkedIn profile have I had to sit in meetings with individuals and get questioned on that sure but you know the way that I, I look at it is I'm creating a space for others to feel open to share with me and to come to the company and if I'm the representative for the company that's why I take the stance to put it out there mm -hmm. so that's to me it's been how do I present to and and really carry that through as a leader Wayne so similar question but just in your role you're, you've got so much experience I know you've spent time working <coughs> with minority businesses the Minority Business Development Council in the chamber and so this ability that you probably have to coach CEOs and founders, what advice would you give to a black or brown CEO who is trying to build and grow a business while also walking in his or her shoes as a person of color in America right now in terms of the balance that they should be play, paying to the issue of furthering the business but also taking an active role in, in the social justice change that's happening? Absolutely. And I think Alicia described it 100%. You have to go the way to show the way, right? 
if you expect others to do these things, then you have to display those yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, it is a very fine line <laughs> that you have to walk. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in terms of how much and how hard do you push the envelope, and that certainly is a decision that each of us has. Each of us has to make individually. But I think if you are going to expect that others will change and others will adhere to those things, then you have to do that yourself. And you have to be, as she said, a leader. Jantina, so similarly, but I wanted to see if you could speak to HR um, directors who may be in the audience, may be participating. What advice do you have for them as they are trying to bring about organizational change, culture change, when it comes to issues of um, DEAI? Sure. So with any change, it's not easy, especially with this particular topic. It's not easy. Um, you're going to come up against people's kind of deep beliefs mm -hmm. that they've grown up with, um, whether it be their religion or their, their kind of familial uh, community and culture. Um, you're also going to come up against, at times, resistance within the organization because an organization may be conservative, it may be progressive. Um, you may have particular leaders who believe in the cause and some who are in essence, um, checking a box. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you have to decide where you stand and be willing to take the risk, as, as my panelists have said, in leading the way, if that's the course that you choose to take. Um, I would say you'll do more damage if you don't wholeheartedly believe in it mm -hmm. and go through the motions. So it's important to really kind of assess, do a self-assessment and figure out how much do I want to push? How much do I want to give in order to see these changes, either within the organizations that you support or across the organization as a, as a total? And I'll, I'll add this. Um, you both kind of talked about how there's a dance or a fine line that you have mm -hmm. to pay attention to as you manage this. Um, I would also say there's a considerable amount of effort that you have to extend in in this space mm -hmm. right because not mm -hmm. only are you trying mm -hmm. to kind of calculate and strategically determine how i'm going to run my business right. but now you're calculating how you're going to show up what you're going mm -hmm. to say who you're going to partner with what implications come with that and so i think that's also something else that we have to keep in mind that people who are on the front line and really leading and advocating for these changes, there's an extra toll and tax that's placed upon them as well. So keep that in mind as you're making your decisions and preparing yourselves to move in the direction that you choose. Oh, that's really well said. Yeah, we, we talk about the black tax. Mm -hmm. I think that that can be <laughs> yeah. applied to so many um, different topics. Uh, so this question for each of you, I just appreciate the insights that you've been sharing and everyone has such a unique perspective and so I want to be able to ask you to each um, answer this question. So one of the things I think we all agree upon is the idea that billions of dollars have been committed. We want to see action. And so if you were king or queen for a day and could institute an initiative or declare a mandate that had a 15 year shelf life in terms of creating a sustainable ecosystem for black and brown businesses, getting to that action, okay. I'd like for each of you to just give us a glimpse of, of what you would, uh, would come up with. So whoever wants to go first. Well, I would focus on mindfulness. We talk about change is hard and Peak Mind obviously is a mental well-being company. And so if we look at how it makes you feel when you talk about these topics, I would really say let's center and give ourselves mindful moments to really sit in our bias uh, sit in that feeling of uncomfort because it's going to be uncomfortable but if we take the time now to sit in it and to work through our feelings and emotions then we'll be healthier leaders going into systemic true conversations but if we don't fix the feelings and emotions then anytime the conversation comes up we're going to fa face some resistance inside of us because it's just a natural it's a, the chemical balance inside of us right and so i would love to pause and take time to reflect and even on our board of directors when we're talking about this topic, we have to have those mindful moments and say, some people are gonna say the wrong words right now. 
because, and we're gonna talk through what those words, how they make other people feel and get through that uncomfort because then by the time maybe next year when we're having these conversations, the, the words are better. Um, terms, you know, terminology is better, and we're all feeling a little bit more comfortable because the closer to comfort we can get, then that's I think we can really pave pave the road. Hmm. Okay, I happen to believe that change happens as a result of supportive pressure. So nuts and bolts guy once again. <laughs> I think a couple things have to happen. I would make sure that going forward, banks and venture capital organizations all had to invest a percentage of their funds in black and brown businesses. Okay. Cash is still king. Without capital, we're not gonna grow, we're not going to make it happen. So if we're gonna have long-term sustainable success and get to that financial and wealth independence, we have to have the capital to fuel it. The second thing, back to the supportive pressure is internal within the organization, back to what Alicia said. Yeah, what she said as well. You're gonna come up against people's beliefs mm -hmm. and how they're raised, really the fiber of their being, and for a lot of those folks, it's really, really hard to change, not because they're against it, but just because it is so much a part of who they are, mm -hmm. it's really difficult to do. So I would like to see, and what I would say is, all corporate organizations would have to have embedded within the employee performance evaluation and process goals that had to be achieved by those employees relative to black and brown business within the organization from a utilization perspective. Supportive piece is those would have to be measurable, definable, and would be a part of their compensation mm -hmm. and their promotability so that mm -hmm. because of that supportive pressure, they are now incented to do those things. That's why they do most of what <laughs> they do in their job today because mm -hmm. that's how they're incented, that's how they get paid, that's how they improve themselves. So this has to be a part of the process that enables them to get better. Once again, back to the supportive pressure. Like that. Now stop preaching. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Right? Diamonds come from pressure, right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so, yes, we'd like to hear from you. Sure. So Queen Jantina. Queen. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> um, I would add, I really like, Wayne, what you said regarding the infrastructure within the organization. Mm -hmm. um, what I've noticed is when it comes to diversity and inclusion, organizations they have ideas, they have initiatives, they have programs, they have goals. However, it's okay if they don't achieve those things. Exactly. When they have other initiatives, if it's a product launch, if it's um, an acquisition of another organization to grow their uh, capacity, if those goals don't happen, yes, we know. We know it happens. Yes. <laughs> and so if I were queen for a day or 15 years, what I would do is ensure that organizations, similar to their philo philanthropic arms or their community outreach arms, or even now their environmental justice arms, mm -hmm. I would make sure there's an arm or an organization within the corporation that is responsible for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I would make sure that their metrics are not tied to profits, but rather the progress that's made within mm -hmm. the communities mm -hmm in which mm. they're uh, hoping to support or, or reaching to support. And so with that, I think we'll see a shift because right now when there's diversity and inclusion uh, initiatives, I think organizations are, they, they've turned it into a business narrative that we know if we're diverse and, inc and inclusive, then our bottom line grows. Mm -hmm. And while that's, that, very well true, mm -hmm. there are other advantages and other reasons why we should be doing this and we forget those and therefore sometimes the initiatives fall short in those spaces where we really need them. So that, that's what I would do and I would also add a policy component where organizations had to pay more attention to their cultural norms and the policies which exist 
that keep black and brown employees, black and brown businesses, et cetera, out of the organization. And sometimes those things are subtle mm -hmm. and neutral mm -hmm. um, until someone raises a hand and says, did you realize? Yes. So I would, mm -hmm. I would offer that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. No doubt. Well, you've all shared some really insightful information. I think the audience will really benefit from your um, your energy and enthusiasm around the topic, but also just sharing kind of your personal journeys. Uh, so we thought this conversation would be important today because there has been a paradigm shift in the last two, two years um, around the way business is conducted and the places where um, black and brown people actually conduct business. And so we felt like because the shift had really presented challenges and opportunities for black and brown business owners that we wanted to highlight um, three experts and um, have them share their experiences and their expertise. Um, we, I continue to believe that uh, we will hopefully see more opportunities for wealth generation, mm -hmm. wealth creation. Um, you know, we will probably continue to pay that black tax, but it is my hope that that um, hard work that we toil will actually produce, you know, and yield high dividends. Um, I think finally, we wanna challenge senior leaders, business owners to take information that was shared today and apply it to your organizations, whether it's just to start a conversation or to move forward with an initiative that you've always had in mind. But um, just wanna end with a thank you to the panelists yeah. and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.